Good morning. Welcome back to another video. It's a history video. Very, very excited. Haven't done one in a little while. Um, and it's very fitting that I'm behind Coco the Hunter's ears today because we are actually looking at hunt horses in the Victorian era, specifically ones that were kept in London, which is something I never really knew. I didn't realise that hunt horses were actually stabled in London. I assumed all hunt horses would have been just kept in the countryside, but no. Um, so we're looking at kind of how they were cared for, their kind of routine, their life. I found a wonderful book which dates to kind of nine. It was published in 1900. Oh, Coco, you and your sneezing. Published in 1900, but it's looking at kind of the late 1800s, first part of the 1900s. Um, and we're actually going to turn here, Coco. What's one handed riding and holding a phone is, is not always ideal. And um, yeah, this book was kind of full of tips and advice for the young groom and the inexperienced sportsman on how to get the best out of their hunter and how to look after them. So really, really interesting book. And at the front of it, it actually has um, a little bit of advertising. So there was a lot of harness, bridles, saddle makers in London in the Victorian period. And this one shows a side saddle for the young lady was around 11 guineas so in modern day money one guinea would be one pound five pence or thereabouts so you're looking at about 12 pounds for a side saddle no snacking cocoa um and the uh, gentleman's saddle would have been around six guineas so just under seven pounds just to give you an idea of pricing back then and Coco, this is the problem with going through the woods. That's Holly, don't eat that. Is um, There's just so much temptation here for Coco. So I always knew that the Victorians enjoyed their hunting. And I assumed that most of the gentlemen and ladies that could afford horses would have owned them in the countryside. But that's not true. They actually had some of their hunt horses in the city. Now, I don't know how many. Now, obviously, in the city, there was a lot of horses back then. Um, you know, specifically looking at London, there were horses to pull the trams and horses to pull the omnibuses and to just, you know, ferry food and the post and everything. So, you know, there was thousands of horses in the city at the time. But I genuinely... And obviously, there would have been riding horses as well. But I just didn't assume hunt horses would ever have been kept there. So, the wealthy ladies and gentlemen of London often kept their horses at the mews. There are some 8,000 mews in London and these would have been in the back streets away from the fancy pants houses but not too far away because obviously they needed them at their beck and calls. So this is where carriage horses were kept or the riding horses or possibly their hunters and the grooms would live above them and you can see from the photos I'm putting in now you can kind of see the outlines of where the kind of carriages would have gone in um, and like the doorway into the little stable area or the stalls which were probably would have been back then and um, that is where they would have lived. Now, to get the hunter super fit, which they would have needed to have been in the Victorian period, there was actually a very favourite place or a popular track where the Victorians enjoyed riding, and that was Rotten Row, which is south side of Hyde Park. And I've actually managed to find a picture of it, and you can just see how busy it is, even in the photo. So this would have been the perfect place to get a hunter fit. Something I had taken no consideration of was how horses were moved around in the Victorian period because obviously there weren't just horse boxes around. In fact, the kind of first horse boxes really were only starting to be made and designed in 1910. So you wouldn't have really seen very many on the roads even through the 1920s and 30s. So horses went on trains. Now, I know somewhere in the back of my mind I probably did know this, but it still shocked me when I read it that horses were transported on trains. So if you think about racehorses back then, racing was incredibly big back in the Victorian period. To move the racehorses up and down the country for their races, they got on the trains. And it was the same for a hunter. So the uh, wealthy gentleman or lady would have sent her groom off or his groom off in the morning with their hunter to the train station. And they would have been very careful not to allow the hunter to get too hot because this horse had a seriously long day ahead of them. So they would have either hacked it or walked it to the train station where they would have actually got them onto a train carriage, which was actually called the horse box. And there was, would have been partitioned into three. And the horses would have been lined up parallel to the train tracks. And there would have been a little sort of compartment area for the grooms to have sat in. And can you imagine how scary that must have been for a horse to be on a steam train? Can you imagine the noise, 
the steam, the smoke, the vibrations that must have come up. I mean, I just think it must have been absolutely terrifying. And actually, I did read some of that they said that horses, some horses really didn't take to train travel, bless them. And then um, it was very hard to get them to go back up it once they'd been on there once before. But I, you can understand. A single hunter from Paddington to Slough with return was 11 shillings and three pence. So it was a fair old price. Once your hunter arrived at the country railway station, somewhere close, hopefully, to the meet, then the groom would obviously bring them off and get them all set up. And most likely the rider will have travelled up on the same train, but in one of the nicer carriages, of course. And at that point, the rider would most likely get onto the horse and hack to the meet. Because obviously not all meets were that close to the railway station, so this horse could have a fair hack just to arrive. And then they had a day's hunting. So this poor horse would be galloping across fields, jumping hedges. Funny enough, one of the interesting bits in this book was that if you were riding a horse that could be a little highly strung, it was very important that you gave them a good hack beforehand because you didn't want to look silly at the meat and you certainly didn't want to fall off. So some of these poor horses may even have had a proper hack before they even started their journey to arriving at the hunt, which is kind of just crazy. After a day's hunting, the horse would be hacked back to the railway station or somewhere near to the railway station where they may well be stabled for half an hour to an hour. And this was a chance to give what would be a very weary horse at this point um, a little bit of food and water. So the grooms would have brought rugs with them. So this time they could now rug the horses up and they would have quite often given them some gruel just before reloading them onto the train. So gruel would have consisted of oatmeal, some cold water, giving it a good mix, and then putting some hot water. Um, And this is really to try and kind of rehydrate the horse, get some food down them, because by this point, they're probably going to be very tucked up. And like I said, feeling incredibly weary. Um, They'd have been given as much hay as they possibly wanted. And like I say, then they would have been loaded back onto the train and taken back into the city. When they arrived back at their own stable, they would probably actually been given even more gruel And it does say that to give them around two to three gallons of it. So a fair amount was trying to be pumped into them. So one of the things that the book suggests if your hunter has had an incredibly hard day's work is to feed them carrots. Now, not just one or two carrots. They like you to have a stockpile of carrots because they advise to feed your hunter around 4.5 kilograms of carrots. Now, this is some carrots Mercado in a one kilogram bag. And I've actually taken a couple out of there. Imagine feeding four and a half of these bags of carrots to your horse after they've been hunting. I mean, I can't imagine that did their systems much good. That's a lot of carrot. Um, But they were very keen on it. They said you should have a really good stockpile of carrots over the winter. Uh, Yeah, I mean, four and a half bags of these they fed to their horses after a busy day's hunting. That can't have been good for the tummy. Next morning, it was advised that if you had an older horse that tended to get quite stiff after they'd been hunting, to take them for a gentle hack to try and help bring the swelling down in their legs and just get them moving again. It was also important to give them good food again, so like bran mash, possibly more gruel, more carrots if they needed to kind of pet the horse up a little bit and it was also advised to give them a loose box if it was available so quite often horses were kept in stalls but obviously if they were in a loose box it meant they could move around a bit more if you were on a young hunter then they would often say to give them the day off because they were kind of fit and well enough to cope with the strenuous activities of hunting but often they did say it would take a horse two or three days to kind of come back to being feeling good after a heavy hunting session and after that then you were allowed to feed them things like oats um, and also something called pea flour which I had never heard of which again was something that was meant to help kind of pet the horse up Um, but wow I mean what a life these horses had it was hard work Um, they would be given as much hay as they wanted but if you were a keen hunt rider it was advised that you have some nine horses because some people wanted to hunt every single day I mean who would have the energy to do that but yes some nine horses to cope with that much hunting Um, so I mean quite impressive really I've absolutely loved finding a little bit more about hunters back in the Victorian period and I hope you have enjoyed this video. Now obviously all the information just comes from books so it may not all be completely true. Um, I'm just going on what was written.